Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, September 11, 2014, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week, I think you're going to see that I really do mean it. I have a lot to cover, so I'm going to get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Makers of Mountain Dew. Perhaps the code don't compensate me for this, but hey, if you're out there, give me a shout out. All right. I'm not sure fluorescent green is a food group, so I'm not sure how we categorize this. Oh, good stuff. All right. Well, there's a disclaimer screen. Unfortunately, sometimes, and sometimes more often than you want, it's always more often than you want, you can lose money trading. Or as I like to say, all predictions are about the future. A lot of stuff can happen between now and then. This is a part of the show where I beg for a review for my book, The Layman's Guide to Trading Stocks. Sometimes there's more people here than our reviews. So somebody's holding out on me. Uh, but, you know, a couple came through recently, so I want to thank you guys and girls for that. Uh, the reason I beg is obvious. Um, ego, vanity, fame, fortune, uh, and other reasons, too, like I've often say. There are some people who review the reviews and say stupid things about the reviews and give you like a, a one star or a zero stars if you can do that. And they never bother reading the book. And so that's kind of frustrating. So um, a few malignant people out there. I can't imagine having that much idle time where you could go review reviews. Anyway, enough of that nonsense, except for that. Give me a book review. That's not nonsense. What do we talk about? Well, a lot of... This week's show is going to be a follow-up on last week's show. I want to talk about a follow-up on the nuances of volatility because this is a developing situation. Um, we had a discretionary example, which actually sort of provided a plethora of examples, including one of discretion, so I want to talk about that. Um, I want to follow up on the IPOs. It's just been a fascinating market in the IPOs all year. It's like we had this incredible bull market, so I said, hey, let me just – do a webinar course on uh, this bull market and show some of these new patterns that I've been trading and, and how I've been making money in the IPOs and how wonderful they are. And then it's like all of a sudden the bull market, the kind of the brakes were tapped and then it kind of came back alive. And now it's a little bit more of you kind of have to work at it a little bit, kind of like the core methodology. It's not as easy as just printing money as it has been on and off uh, for most of the year. And we'll get into all that in just one second. Anything you want me to cover, start thinking about it now. Um, and I'll be happy to get to it as time allows. Hold off on your individual stock picks until we get to the actual charts, and that will make life just a lot easier for me. And it also will keep your stock pick from getting buried in the questions and not answered. Uh, also, when we do get the stock picks, if you want to know about 50 stocks, that's fine. I'm going to stay here. Uh, until uh, until the recording says I should probably wrap things up. But usually I stay here about a half an hour later than normal. And, um, but just ask about one stock that hit carriage return, or hit return, whatever they call it nowadays, his inner, I guess, uh, carriage return, I'm showing my age. Um, and that way I'll see one stock on each line, I could delete it after I talk about it. If you ask about six, I'll pick one or two out of those, and I'll probably forget which ones I covered, and you won't get the rest of them covered. All right. Um, last week we talked about a possible big move coming. And the reason I talked about that is markets tend to oscillate between high volatility and low volatility, okay? And when you get a low volatility situation, traders don't tend to agree for long. So let's say the market shoots up, this starts doing this, okay? Well, traders don't tend to agree, again, for long. But what often happens in a low volatility situation is you get a fake out. It looks like the market's going to roll over, and then it turns around and goes straight back up. But that's the best when it's in a longer-term uptrend. So I'm still hoping, and you hate to use the word hope, but I'm still hoping this is a scenario that could be developing in the P's. Now, let me show you. Um, if you need these formulas, I'll give them to you, by the way. Uh, more like Something like Metastox is a lot more robust when it comes to dealing with formulas. I don't do that much with formulas. But every now and then when I do, I would prefer to use something like Metastock. And I just set this up on the fly because I had it. Um, 
So I do occasionally use Metasocks for those things. I use Telechart because it's quick and dirty for my scanning, and I couldn't live without it. But there are some uses for Metastock, and I've used Metastock for the past, oh, shoot, geez, probably 20 years. Uh, and, and this is the kind of stuff that it does great with because the formula, this formula here is about 200 lines long, which I'll give to you if you want it. Um, it's a rec it's kind of a recursive thing where it's like somebody I actually did write it somebody actually did the cut and paste it but I actually did write the one in Metastock and the one in Metastock is like you know I, I might have borrowed it from somebody but regardless I punched it into my computer one key at a time wasn't a cut and paste type of deal and it's only like one or two lines so it just shows you the difference uh, in the programs but I'll give you the formula if you want this is the six day historical volatility divided by the 50-day historical volatility, okay? So this kind of becomes the average, kind of like the longer-term volatility, and this is a shorter-term volatility. So that ratio, and I borrowed this from Larry Connors many, many years ago. In fact, I actually wrote about it. I was asked to do a dossier, I guess, if you would call it, kind of a list of accomplishments for uh, – um, for a company that's looking to do some business with me, and I'll explain that later um, at some point once it's once it's known. But anyway, um, in going through that, I, I just I had forgotten that in the mid nineties I'd, I'd wrote a, an article on volatility, and it was based on some of uh, Connor's research. And he had got that for last week. I said I would get it. It's uh, Natenberg. Last week I promised you I, I would I would give you that book on volatility. My um, Oh, okay, here it is, Option Volatility and Pricing Strategies, and if, it looks like it's Natenberg. So that's the book I was talking about last week where Connor was inspired to do, Connors was inspired to do his uh, volatility research, and then my volatility research comes from um, from Larry Connors, uh, too, and I actually written, uh, wrote an article in Stocks and Commodities in the early 90s about this, or mid-90s, I should say, and... The, the point I'm trying to make is it's something that I discovered independently of Larry. And um, when I showed him the pattern, he's like, oh, yeah, I figured that out too. And it was kind of neat. It was kind of a cool thing to discover something that somebody else had discovered, but he hadn't made it public yet. Anyway, my point is that everybody knows, kind of like um, everybody knows it's a bad idea to, or very – um aggravating to play cards with Kenny Rogers, right? But everyone knows that when you have that low volatility situation, you begin to have an expansion in volatility. In fact, as Larry had wrote or written, however you say it, the volatility can be more predictable than price. And that really inspired me to do a lot of volatility research earlier by trading. And I came back to the momentum, or I never really left momentum, as I've said before. But I did learn a lot about volatility in that, and I have incorporated that into my my trading. I guess everything sort of makes you, you. Like I tell everyone, don't use any indicators other than maybe the occasional moving average. But I, in my holy grail hunt, used every indicator in the world. But that's what makes me me. So maybe you do have to go through that same sort of holy grail hunt or something. But anyway, all this volatility research really dovetailed nicely into my trading. And everybody knows that low volatility turns to high volatility. So traders don't agree for long and all of a sudden you get a big move one way or the other. What you may not know is often the first move is a false one. So what will happen is you'll get a market that's in a very narrow range, just kind of bumping along, bumping along, and you get like a knockout move, and then the next move out is higher. And I was gonna, actually going to publish some research on this many, many years ago, and it just sort of fell through. But it was, um, oh, geez, maybe 15 years ago. It was, it was kind of the 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 discovery that Connors and I both have, and it was going to be based on this this false move in volatility. And it actually tests out um, if you were to take a low volatility situation and wait for a false move and then look to go the opposite way. 
Now, obviously, um, the reason it tests out, or one of the reasons it tests out, is because let's say it breaks out, it keeps on going. Well, that wouldn't be a trade, okay? So the fact that it would actually have to fake out and prove itself and go the other way, that actually helps to confirm the trade and make it work. Anyway, so if you take the six-day HV, now keep in mind that HV is it's, it's historical volatility. And you look at that formula. I don't know if you can see this on your screen, but it's the square root log blah, blah, blah of the day-over-day -day period. And it's a very complex formula. But just like when I came to my office this morning, I flipped the switch. I know a little bit about electricity, but you really don't have to know anything about electricity to flip a switch. So you don't have to understand logarithms to understand volatility. Just know that historical volatility is a measurement of volatility. It's also a measurement on a closing basis. So if you notice in this chart, here's a close, here's a close, here's a close. Okay. Well, you see volatility is kind of peaking out and actually beginning to drop because that market is closing within a small range. Notice that when the close changes dramatically, okay, the volatility begins to go up dramatically, okay? And also notice, and here's one little aberration, notice that when the market begins to become orderly, okay, the volatility begins to drop off, okay? Now, one other phenomenon, and this is a little bit more obvious, is when, and oh, by the way, this is why you'll notice that you probably know this already, but they slide faster than they glide, okay? So when a market sells off, volatility spikes. And then that's why, like a lot of times, you get that spike in volatility, and then what happens, the market will bottom out, and then it'll begin to take off again. Now, notice that as it worked its way higher, the volatility really begin to drop off. And then volatility will also drop off when your day over day changes or very small. So, so far we had a bit of a fake out to the downside. So it's possible that our next move could be to the upside, but you don't want to rush it and trade it. It's just good to know these things. Why do we care about volatility for your methodology? Nothing significant about that in Layman's Guide or there are rules using volatility in your methodology. Um, well, let me pull out Layman's Guide to Trading Stocks, which I happen to have here. My one and only copy. And let's see if we talk about, yep, page 116 is what you need to know about volatility. Now, you don't need to know about volatility ratios, that I'm, what I'm teaching you now, because it's not necessarily, you're right, it's not necessarily part of the methodology. But it's something that's worth knowing. Now, I tend to, the only time I plot a volatility ratio is when I'm teaching it, as I am now. I just tend to eyeball it and say, oh, well, this market really hasn't gone anywhere in a while. So I know that it's due to make a move. So, yeah, you need to know that volatility does revert to its mean. And then if things get quiet for a while, you know that volatility can expand. You also need to know that it's a moving target. It's constantly expanding in contraction. And again, all these things help you to, to trade, to have, help wrap your, or, uh, wrap your head around things. And like I said in layman's, you, you, it, it often preach, you need that volatility to understand that volatility for when you get into positions to know where to set your stops. Okay? And you never know for sure, but it does help to give you a feel for things. So um, you don't have to go into an intense volatility study like I did, but know that volatility tends to expand and contract. And know that the personality of a stock, if it's a volatile stock bouncing around 5 and 10 points a day, you're not going to be able to trade that stock with a 1 or 2 point stop. And There's a popular methodology. I'm not going to pick on them because I learned a lot from 
uh, that sort of helped to make me who I am too. I learned a lot about technical analysis from the gentleman, but their their system says uh, 8% stop. Well, I'm trading stocks that move around 15 20% a day. If I try to use an 8% stop, as I've said before, it'd be like all of us – It'd be like saying everybody should wear a medium-sized shirt. I've been an extra large now, and some shirts, designer shirts, I wear like a triple extra large. I'm a pretty big dude. So different personalities, different sizes. Stocks come in different shapes and sizes, just like people. So you have to understand the volatility, the nature of the beast that you're dealing with, and it doesn't hurt to understand some nuances about it. Okay, know that again, it expands and contracts. And know that if a stock is volatile, if it's a triple extra large, it's probably going to continue to be a triple extra large. It might quiet down for a while, but know that it's going to it's going to likely wake up again. In fact, I actually called that a sleeping tiger back when I was doing a lot of that volatility research. Okay, all right, Robert saying I got it. That's enough. All right, good. I tend to go off on tans. Okay. Any functionality, persistent versus volatility? Yes, that is a um, that's a good question. And I'm not sure by the word functionality if there's something that's tradable in that. But it is it is a neat phenomenon to observe. Persistency, as you may know, is a market's ability to go up day after day. Oops, I ran out of pen space. And mathematically, it's equivalent to linear regression. Okay, but you know me, I like to keep it simple. I like to draw a line through as many bars as possible. So you will know that is one phenomenon or characteristic of volatility is that that volatility is going to drop when that market persists. So sometimes you forget, sometimes you just think volatility is, is the market going sideways, okay, or is it going up or down? But the reality is, I'm sorry. Sometimes with volatility, you're thinking, is the market bouncing around or going sideways? Okay. So if it's bouncing around, it's volatile. If it's going sideways, it's not volatile. But there's also a characteristic of volatility with trend in that markets, when the volatility begins to spike, you know that that market might be finding a bottom. And when the, mar when the volatility gets really complacent, sometimes the market might be finding a top. Sometimes. Okay. It, but it's more important, I think, on the downside than the upside because a lot of times a market can, like like I said, they, they glide faster than they slide. A market can get really, really quiet for a while and then make a new leg higher. But when a market begins to get kind of panicky and everybody's kind of rushing for the door at the same time, eventually that selling is, exhausts itself. Uh, a, case, a great case study would be 2009. We had that spike low where it just seemed like, What's the old saying? It's like the, the doom and gloom is so thick in the air, it's like you can almost cut it with a knife. When that occurs, that's when things are really just the absolute god-awful worse. That volatility just goes through the moon. You get a VIX reading of 100 and something stupid, 100 and stupid, okay? You know that that market is probably sold out. Anyway, long-winded explanation of saying... Market got quiet, and hope, and I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully this is our fake out now that we're experiencing, and then the market will go on to make new highs. Now, we're going to get to the overall market and sectors and such in just a few minutes, and it is getting a little mixed out there. And like I wrote in today's column, you, you have to see both sides. You always have to see both sides. You have to see the upside. You have to see the downside. And sometimes in the summertime, usually the summertime, not all the time, but usually, you also have to see that maybe sometimes, just sometimes, the market can go sideways. All right, any questions on volatility before we go any further? Steve, I'm not sure. Uh, by functionality, do you mean predictability or anything? Because that market is going to persist. As that market persists, that volatility is going to go down. So there is a divergent behavior between the two. Now, whether or not you could actually trade that, I don't know, but that's a fascinating question. Um, I'd be interesting, interested to hear any of your research or thoughts on that. Um, I tend to eyeball persistency. I love persistency. It's one of my favorite things. In fact, the more I look at it, the more I love it. I did a webinar just yesterday. And that's the beauty of teaching is that 
I learn markets through teaching, and that's why I, I plus I'm a ham and I love doing this. Um, and I'm I'm a emphatic. What's the word for it? Just a excited about it, a champion of technical analysis. And I love it. And But one thing I notice is like whenever I'm putting together these well-chosen examples, admittedly well-chosen examples, and the reason I use well-chosen examples, especially for big winners, is because if you want to get good at analyzing winners and finding winners, you better look at some winners, okay? It's like counterfeit currency detectives, and I'm writing about this actually um, as I, well, not as I speak, but recently. And if you want to get good at the kind of thing, uh, let me back up a second. This Mountain Dew is really kicking. A little bit too much today, Dave. <laughs> um, yeah, counterfeit currency detectives, they don't study fake dollars, okay? They study genuine dollars, okay? And if you study that dollar, and I'm, I don't know how much they study it, but they study it a lot, and they know every little characteristic and every little nuance of what goes into that dollar bill. And there's a lot of things that go into it. And there's probably a lot of things that you and I don't know that go into it because we're not currency detectives, right? But they don't sit around all day looking at crappy dollars. They sit around all day looking at, I guess they sit around all day, whatever they do. But they're looking at the genuine article. So when they see a fake, it's it's obvious. And that same line of reasoning, I think, really works well when it comes to markets. So if you're studying the best of the best positions or setups or winners, however you want to look at it, then you're going to get better and better at looking at those. But anyway, the, you're probably thinking, does this guy have a point? <laughs> well, yeah, my point is that it seems like any time I use these well-chosen, these cherry-picked examples, that... Nine out of ten times, there's a, a, a fantastic persistency characteristic that's within that market. And another thing that also shows up quite a bit is acceleration. But persistency, number one. So uh, so maybe the HV can help you find the persistency, but I tend to just like to eyeball it. Okay, Now, thinking out loud... Maybe you look for that uh, persistency. Maybe you look for the beginning of the persistency, and then you have some sort of acceleration characteristic into it. Because it seems like persistency combined with acceleration can make for some incredible setups. So CLDX was one that had that. Uh, that that's one of the big winners that comes to mind. Uh, not too recently, um, or fairly recently, I should say, that had that persistency characteristic. So. Uh, if anything, it, it just seems like everything that's good has persistency. Now, let's take a look at this um, discretionary example here. This is an IPO, and lo and behold, it did have some persistency in it. Look, see that? Okay. Again, draw a line as through as many bars as possible. And, you know, you're on to something with the volatility thing, but you have to – it's kind of like Einstein said, make things as simple as possible but not – simpler and just try to keep it fairly simple so you want to reduce things down it's like how is that HV going to help you is it going to help you identify the persistency or what are you going to do with it and the bottom line is you could still just eyeball the chart uh, you could use linear regression or you could draw a line through the bar so just whenever you start getting into those those um, formulas by the time you get to the third derivative you might need to stop every now and then and go back to price, okay? In fact, always go back to price first and foremost. But if these tools can help you, then by all means, use them, okay? Anyway, I uh, want to show you something with this stock. I want to talk a little bit about discretion. What's the best book to study volatility? Well, if you want to get into it kind of deeply, uh, option volatility and pricing strategies, um, I think that I got into volatility in my first book. It's been so long. <laughs> I don't remember. Um, I don't have a copy. In I have a Russian copy here in front of me. I don't have a um, – I can't reach the, the English one. But I thought I covered it in the first book. Um, read that A Volatility Trade in Gold would be good to read. You could get it. You could find it on the Internet somewhere. 
Uh, it's, if not stocks and commodities, I think I'll sell it to you for a dollar forty nine or something like that. Of of which I won't get anything. So um, don't worry about that. What else? What else would be good to read about volatility? I mean, Natenberg's book is pretty deep. Um, I don't think you have to go that far. I think you just need to maybe read the article that I talked about. Connors wrote about volatility a lot early, um, at least early on. I know he's he's ventured off with some other things now, but uh, he would be a good he would be somebody good to read about. Okay, uh, let's take a look at this discretionary example here, and we got a trigger on this stock here. It was sort of a TKO type of setup. And in hindsight, it wasn't a huge TKO, but I'm a little bit more lenient when it comes to IPOs and uh, in, in, the, in the magnitude of the patterns and such. It triggered, and then within two days, it stopped out. Now, the stop was right here. And then notice that it did dip a little bit below the stop, so it wasn't a cut and dry stop nick. A stop nick is a market that comes down and just gives the, give the stop, gives the stop, a little kiss, a little stop kiss, and then turns around, takes off, and goes back. Now, in a situation like this, it's okay to stay with the position, okay? In fact, it's kind of a no-brainer. It's like, oh, they're coming to get me. You know what? Let me just give it a little wiggle room just in case it reverses right at the stop. And sometimes it will. Not all the time, but sometimes. But sometimes it will dip a little bit below like it did here. Now it did it went down twenty nine cents below the stop. Now that's not that big of a deal in a twenty dollar stock in a volatile twenty dollar stock. So the volatility eh, it went up a little bit. We're gonna talk about that too. The volatility increased a little bit in the position after we got into it. So I didn't fully gauge the volatility properly of this position. But twenty nine cents is not a huge is not a huge deal, but you do have to have some uncle point in mind. I have a client a while back uh, sent me a thank you letter because uh, I, I said, hey, guys, this stock's getting kind of close to the STOP. And he said it was, a, it was about a $16 stock. And he says, you know what, Dave, I'm going to give it 50 cents. If it goes to 15.50, I'm going to get out because the stock was around 16 or so. And it never did get to 15.50. It dropped below 16, but it never did get to 15.50. So you have to have a point in mind where you're going to get out, no questions asked. Also, we had one that went down, did a little stop kiss at nine, and then now it's trading at thirty something dollars a share. Somebody asked me, "Well, why did you set your stop at eight point nine nine?" And the reason is because nobody's that good. Okay, I thought that my stop was far enough away given the volatility. It was also a trailing stop, but obviously it wasn't. To the, it was one. I was one penny away. So realize that the market doesn't trade on exacts and isn't always perfect. So if you could apply a little bit of discretion here and there to stay with a position. And you could see it went on and had a pretty good rally, but then came back in. Now, that's lesson number one. Lesson number two is, let's say you get stopped out of a position, but it looks even better than it looked before you got in. So now we've got what looks like a legitimate TKO. So I hate to do this to my people sometimes because I'm always nervous that, it's going to trigger that second time and then come back in. And now you got two losses in one position. So that's something you have to learn to live with. But I came back and said, you know what, guys? If you didn't stay with it, it's worth a second shot. Here's your entry. Here's your profit target. And then one day, bam, went up and hit that. And unfortunately, it came right back down and stopped out. Okay? Now, what I did here was... Instead of moving the stop to break even, I decided that I would give it a little bit of rum just in case because it, it made this move in one day so fast, just in case it came back down and then took off again. But it obviously did not. It came back down and it stopped out. Well, it's better than a poke in the eye, okay? So if you'd have stayed with the first trade, you'd have did okay. And if you stayed with the – if you got knocked out the first trade, took the second trade, you'd probably be a little worse than break it even, okay? But nothing ventured, nothing gained. So the point is – it's okay to exercise a little bit of discretion when it comes to trading, okay? All right, got some questions stacking, stacking up. Let's see. Did we cover that? Yeah. 
Do you feel like the market finds your stop at times? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, but that's the problem is you, you, you can't personalize that market. You got to be really careful not to do that, okay? Um, but yeah, it seems like somehow that market finds your stop. And that's just, that's just the ebb and flow of the traders. Yes, there are people, yeah, markets are manipulated, okay? Let's just, let's just flat out. Markets are manipulated. As I said before, I've had, this has happened on more than one occasion, but I had one guy who would email me 15 times a day. You see? You see? It's manipulated. You see? You see? And here's another example. It is another example. And I'm like, yeah, so what? So what? So he was getting stopped out because he was trying to trade to the penny, and it's like they kept manipulating the market and knocking him out. Well, so what? That manipulation could work both ways. That could actually help you in your trading because it might push it in the direction that you want it to go. But what you have to do is, because you studied volatility, not to the not the not the logarithmic nature of blah 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 or the inverse um, you know ratios and all this other stuff I'm talking about, but just the fact that hey, it's bouncing around so much, maybe my stop needs to be outside of where it's bouncing around. Maybe I can't wear a medium shirt because I'm a big fat bastard. You know, <laughs> the analogy. I'm talking about myself, not you, of course. Okay, so you have to embrace volatility, embrace the nature of the beast you're trading. And this stock here sure seems like it's manipulated like crazy, right? Seems like they're out to get me because they came down, got my stop, and then it turned around. Well, that's where you could use a little bit of discretion. Now, if it's down here, down here, down here, down here, down here, then you know you are wrong and you should have gotten out a long time ago, okay? So what's the second part of your question, Matt? Let's see if we can find it. Um, even getting a bad feel on purpose. I don't know what you mean about getting a bad feel on purpose, but trust me, they're going to get away with anything they can. Okay? You're dealing with a bunch of, I hate to say the word scumbags, but there's some scummy things that happen. Okay? And you just have to say, look, we're trading for a short to hopefully an immediate term and longer term gain. And all that effing noise, okay, especially once you get out of that swing trade, all that effing noise doesn't matter. And you can't get caught up in it. For me, and I think I learned this from Douglas, you know, if not, I'll give him credit because he has helped me more than anyone else when it comes to trading psychology. Okay, that and that and um, becoming friends with a lot of professionals to see that we all go through the same things and we all still have a pulse. Just because we decide to become a trader doesn't mean we no longer have a, a pulse. But what I learned from Douglas was to try to watch things and watch be the key word in that sentence. Try to watch things as they're happening, but not so much happening to you, maybe kind of like a movie. And that's kind of a, that's not the greatest analogy in the world, but I've learned to control myself to a point where I, I say things like, that's interesting, okay, as opposed to to the F-bombs. Now, I still drop the F-bombs, don't get me wrong, okay, but you have to learn to to see things as, ha like once you're in a position, you have to learn to see things as happening as opposed to happening to you. Mike Tyson said, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face, okay? What would the entry and stop be on DSKY now? Uh, we'll take a look at it when it gets to the charts. I don't know. I don't know if it's set up exactly now. When it comes to the charts, pull it up again. We'll look at it. Okay. A lot of questions coming in. Seems like you're explaining your actions in a stock that you wouldn't endorse others to trade it if they suggested it. Seems like you're explaining your actions in a stock that you wouldn't endorse others to trade if they, I don't understand what you mean. You lost me on that one. Is there like a first part to that? I 
Okay, Dave, this was a chart that was from someone during the end of your presentation. You look at it and say volatility and say, not for me, it's a bottle rocket all over the place, yet it seems to be in this crazy DSKY. What's up with that? No, it's not a bottle rocket. And number two, uh, did you go to the IPO course? Because in the IPO course, we discussed that, that the psychology of an IPO is different than a stock that's been trading for an established period of time. And there will be some bottle rocket characteristics. But in this stock, this is not a bottle rocket. This is a trend, okay? Even though it's only been on the market a little while, that's a trend. That's not a bottle rocket. It went up, uh, what, 40%? That's not a bottle rocket. A bottle rocket is 200% over two days or something like that. So that's not a bottle rocket. This is a TKO. In fact, this is textbook, if anything. That's beautiful as far as a textbook TKO. You've got persistency. It's worked its way higher. It's not a bottle rocket at all, okay? Bottle rocket is a stock that goes straight up and then comes right back in. It goes up like 100% or 200% over a couple days. You don't want to trade that stock, okay? In an IPO, I'm a little bit more lenient. There are some bottle rocket characteristics, although this is not a good example of it, but if you... If you get the course, not to, not to soft sell you on that, but you're going to understand a lot more on, on how the IPOs work. And, you know, I hate to be, um, what's the word? I don't, I'm, the word escapes me, but I think that, you know, maybe I'm vain, but I, I'm telling you that I, the, the IPO course is worth a hell of a lot more. I should have, I, in fact, I probably need to raise the price on that. I, it's way too cheap. It probably needs to be a $2,000 course. Because there's a lot of things in there, just like I just said, like the bottle rocket explanation and understanding the the psychology, the new psychology of a new issue and the way they trade as opposed to an existing issue. Anyway, before I forget, let's talk a little bit about discretion. You want to use your brain and a little common sense, okay? Uh, we just had an example, 29 cents, well, that's hard to say. That's hard to say whether or not that's too far or not to use discretion, but it is a new issue. We don't know how it's going to trade. It's become kind of volatile. It's also the spreads are turned out to be a little crappier than first thought, okay? So you might have that 15%, 15%, 15-cent or 20-cent spread. So that extra 30 cents or 29 cents could just be noise alone, and it's okay to give them a little wiggle room in a case like that. So common sense is okay. And when I say, the reason I say common sense is you don't want to throw caution to the wind. You don't want to say, oh, well, uh, it hit the stop, but uh, let me give it another five days and see what happens. No, don't do that, okay, or five points, whatever the case may be. Say, okay, it hit the stop. This kind of stinks, to put it mildly. But if it reverses within so many cents, then I'm going to get out, okay? So you need to think in terms of incremental risk, okay? If your stop is here, you're going to have an incremental risk of this, okay? Let's call it X, okay? And hopefully longer term, and I just said hope. In fact, it will. Longer term, it will pay off by staying with winners. So, for instance, we had the stock nip Nick at 9 and now the stock's at 35. So now you stayed with a winner that's up 500% uh, from the beginning. I guess 350% uh, from the stock nick. So this one trade that you stay with is going to pay for 100 of these. Now, don't come crying to me when you get stopped, when you give it a little bit more rub and then you lose a quarter, lose a quarter, lose a quarter four or five times in a row because that probably will happen because they won't always turn around. But longer term, you're going to stay with the winner, and that's going to make all the difference in the world. Now, keep in mind, something bad could always happen, okay? You're in XYZ, comes down, gives a little stock kiss, okay? Hey, Dave says to stick with it. Hey, it looks so far I'm right, and then the gap's down 10 points against you three days later, okay? It happens, okay? But you can't second-guess yourself and say, damn it, I should have gotten out. 
three days ago when my stop was hit. Why did I apply discretion? Well, you apply discretion because longer term you're going to win by doing that. Longer term you're going to win by using your brain. Why? Well, somebody just said, hey, Dave, does it seem like the market's manipulated? Yes, the market is manipulated. But who cares? What you're going to do is you're going to say, ah, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to accuse them of messing with you because then it starts messing with your mindset. You just got to look at the bar and say, okay, there's some buying and selling, and looks like that there's more uh, pressure on the buys on the sell side, more selling pressure than buying pressure, and it's pushing into this stock. But let's see if it's going to resume its uptrend after the selling exhausts itself, and I'm going to buy. I'm going to give it a little bit more wiggle room in order for that to happen. Try not to. I know I just said they're manipulated. But but don't have that negative mindset that, oh, it's being manipulated and going against me, because that's going to make you want to fight back. It's like the old alligator analogy. You know, it's like a, I never would want to test this out. In fact, I think it's an urban legend. But if you get eaten by an alligator, the worst thing you could do is move. The more you move, the more it eats you. That's kind of like what happens in the market. It's like if you try to fight back, the more you fight back, the worse you're going to be. Okay. Now, again, if it goes to the penny, if your stop's at 9 and it goes to 9 and never trades below 9, then it's pretty cut and dry. You stay with the position. So anything else is not so easy. Okay, So that's what you got to ask yourself. Maybe I, under I underestimated volatility a little bit. Maybe I underestimated the liquidity a little bit. Okay, and In the case of the last example, it was a little bit of both. None of us are perfect. None of us could get it exactly right. And guess what? Market is constantly changing. The market is a bunch of participants. It's a bunch of people. And you don't know what those people are going to do. You don't even know what you're going to do half the time unless you have a plan in place, right? So if you can't be disciplined enough to know what to do, how can you expect everybody else to be disciplined enough to do the right thing, okay? So it's possible. Now, if you are disciplined – then you could use an alarm. Obviously, somebody, it's, it's an obvious question, but I should mention it. Somebody said, you know, Dave, you always preach using stops. Well, I preach using stops as a concept. Unless I'm going to be, if I'm going to be away from the market, I'll put in what I call an airbag, which I think I borrowed that term from a book called Trading Chaos, which I don't remember the book striking a chord with me as a book that I like very much. But I will, you know, and my apologies to, I think it's Bill Williams or something who wrote that, but my apologies to him. I'm just, I like trading trends. But I did like his concept of airbags, meaning that a stop that's far away to be well outside that normal, that normal volatility. If it gets hit, it's going to suck, okay? It's going to be a big hit, but you're going to be able to live the fight another day. And you can have a hard stop in if it's far enough away to where you give that market ample room to breathe, and so you could go out and do something, and just in case it gets hit, okay. But if you're going to be, um, if you have a smartphone, which I think we all do now, I think I ended up the last person on the planet that has one. My wife made me get one because I was, <laughs> I'd go to these conferences and I'd flip open this little Star Trek looking phone, <laughs> looking like I was going to call the 80s or something. And my wife's like, "You can't, you can't have a little dinky flip phone. You got to have at least a, a real phone." So she made me get an iPhone. Um, and she just handed it to me. I had no choice. She shook my other phone and threw it away. Uh, so we most, most of us have smartphones. So just set an alarm so you get an alarm when that, when that stop is getting close. Don't set it at the stop. Set it like, say, 50 cents. It depends on the price of the stock, obviously. But 50 cents within that stop. So you know it's getting close, and you might have to take a little action. Don't watch a screen all day. That will drive you nuts. But you might want to watch around the open because that's when most of the discretion is going to happen. Also, if you, you're coming into a day and you're within so many cents of a stop, you know it's pretty close to getting stopped out. You might want to make sure you have that alarm in place and set and go about your lives. Go about saving lives and, and doing other great things. Okay. So if you are disciplined, feel free to use alarms. Okay. All right. We have a lot of questions stacking up. Good, 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 good. Is there a reason that you like DSK other than the chart? There is never a reason to like a stock other than a chart. Okay? <laughs> no, I, I have no idea what they do. I have no idea. Okay? Um, okay, good.
Okay, maybe it's a topic for another session, the distinction between HV and H ATR, specifically as it relates to noise and where to play stops. Cheers. Well, I eyeball both of those things, but I do sort my stocks by historical volatility. So I want to look at the most volatile stocks first, but when it comes to placing my stop, I eyeball the chart, and I'm looking at the ATR, the average true range. I have written articles. If you dig around the Internet, you could probably find them on setting stops. I don't have them on my own websites. They're on other websites. Uh, they, they all, the genesis of them were from trading markets. And I talked about statistically based stops using ATR and HV. The problem with statistically based stops is they're going to be so darn wide that they're just too wide. Okay, if you're, out, if you're outside of the statistical place where the stop should be, but if you're eyeballing the stock and you've got some pattern and structure in place, and let's say you're trading a pullback and that market's already stretched in one direction, okay, well, chances are chances of it continuing to be stretched in that direction within the volatility of the stop, of, of your eyeballing that stop, or, um, or for instance, let me, just, let me just show you that, what I'm trying to say. So there's a, there's a structure to it you can add to it. If you're just using a statistically based stop, okay, let's say you got a market that looks like this, and it pulls back, okay? Well, a statistically placed stop is going to say, oh, you need to have a stop down here. Well, that makes no sense, but it's measuring the average true range. It's measuring historical volatility, and based on that formula, this stock could either trade here or here, over the next few days, so your stop would have to be way down here. Well, if you're looking at this stock, and you're seeing it's in a pretty serious trend, but it's already had a pretty serious move down, you know there's a pretty good chance that it can make a reversion to the mean move back in the direction of the trend. So your stop might be about right here, okay? Now, if it's got an H, now if you're looking at your HV, and let's say it's 80 or something, some big number, Okay, he's like, okay, well, I better give it some room, but I see it's already stretched pretty far to begin with. So I think I'm going to put my stop right around here if I get triggered in. And in some cases, too, let's say you're trading in Witch Hat or something, and the market is a sharp sell-off, has a sharp retrace. I mean, sometimes, and, and I, I'm not a huge fan of this because we're trying to stay with positions longer term, but sometimes if you want to go in and take a stab at a market, sometimes you can get in like right here, and have that stop right above that second little peak in there because the market is so overbought to begin with. You can take a stab at it and use like a super, super duper tight stop. So the point is you want to combine, you want to make sure you're looking at the pattern and the structure of the pattern when you're going to um, put that stop in, okay? D Sky makes CD player on a stick. Very good. There you go. Rasky seems to advocate ATR, while Connors uh, seems to ad advocate H HV. Both both very smart people, so uh, use a combination of both if you want. In essence, trading IPOs requires enhanced wiggle room, position sizing down, liberal stops, and a different mind to realize IPOs are different. Uh, to some extent, you don't have... Uh, I mean, we've spent, how many hours have we spent on the IPO course so far? Uh, almost 10 hours so far on IPO, so to wrap, it would be hard for me to wrap it up in five minutes. But, yeah, uh, you, you're, you don't know the psychology of the market because everything is new. Now, there are advantages to that because you don't have bad memories coming in. You have some people that are looking to get off the hook, the underwriters, the insiders, et cetera, the venture capitalists, okay, but you don't have any visible bad memories. You don't have that overhead supply and things like that. And there's a lot of other reasons why to trade IPOs. But, yeah, more lenient. Uh, I actually have some breakout, I know, gas type of patterns, believe it or not, in the IPOs. And sometimes you can get a flagpole in IPOs uh, or, or what I call a, a, which looks like a bottle rocket. It'll just take off make a quick little pullback and take off again. If I saw that in an individual stock, I would I would be less excited about it. But in an IPO, and again, we spent 10 hours talking about this, so it's going to take a, it's kind of hard for me to jam it into two minutes that I have. But you got to realize that if that thing's going up 
everybody's happy. Everybody who who is in that stock, everybody, all the insiders are happy, all the venture capitalists are happy, everybody looking to get off the hook is happy, everybody who bought it is happy. So it's a little bit different mindset than a stock that is more established. Okay. So again, everything I do has a psychological basis behind it. And I built the case for these specific patterns. And they're a little bit different than the core methodology, but not much. I didn't completely disregard the core methodology. And the core methodology is still going to be the bread and butter, but there's going to be times when these IPOs are going to offer tremendous opportunities. And that's the whole point I've been trying to make. In 2014, that's one of the things that's worth worked better than anything. Now, let's get into the IPO report while we're here. Um, once again, speculation is alive and well, but I think you're going to have to work at it. I was looking at some spreadsheets this morning and adding some things up. And um, a while back, it was kind of an, a shotgun approach. You could almost buy them all, and they'd all go up. But now it's becoming more of an outlier versus a shotgun approach. There's some losers there's some better than the poke in the eye trades, which means that it goes up, comes back in. D Sky, that was a good example. We just looked at that one, okay? CD on a stick. And then there's been a few outliers. And it's kind of like, well, that's kind of like the core methodology, right? It's like we have some losers, we have some winners that are okay, some mediocre ones, and then all of a sudden, bam, 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 we knock it out of the park. So it's been a little bit more of an outlier type of market than it has been in. Uh, the past. So my point is that it is acting more like the core. Now, if any of you remember 2000, up until March at least, in 1999, in the late 90s for that matter, the core methodology, just trend following one on one, absolutely printed money. Okay, so that's when the core methodology works the best. In the meantime, anything in between, you have to work at it a little bit. Stops are important. Discretion is important. Um, money management, obviously, is vitally important. Stock selection is vitally important. That's why, not to, not to, you know, I'm soft selling today, but not to soft sell it. But that's why I did the course of stock selection because. That's a missing piece. People need to learn how to pick stocks. If we're in a rip roaring bull market, everything going up, eh, throw a dart. Doesn't really matter. Okay, as long as it has, it looks like it's going up. Yeah, it's going up. But nowadays, it's a little bit more complicated. That stock selection has become more and more important. So the the IPOs now a little bit tougher than they were earlier in the year, but I think there's still a lot of opportunities there and the early phase demarcation is still pretty good and that's something that was covered in a lot of details but the nutshell of that is they either fly or they die they come public okay this is time and for the most part as a general statement it seems like they either take off or they don't and that demarcation is coming back into the market and that's pretty cool. And I'll show you an example of that. So speculation is alive and well. And this is the best thing since camera on a stick. So this is G Pro. I stole that from Doug Newberry, by the way, that uh, Newberry at uh, Market Toolbox. That's what he, he calls it. I don't know where he got it, but I'll give him credit. Okay. So there's camera on a stick kind of going straight up. So that tells me that speculation is alive and well if camera on a stick can go up. Now, we have had some winners, not as many as I'd like, of course, but so far so good on this AMPH, okay? Uh, you were asking about a bottle rocket. Well, this is one of the patterns we actually trade. If this was a regular issue and it went straight up like that, I'd say, no, leave it alone. Margin call. How many times do I have to tell you? I do a webinar every Thursday. <laughs> so, anyway, so we had some winners. And we had some losers, okay? This looked pretty darn good. Triggers, comes back in, stops us out. Now, one thing I'm kind of noticing with some of these losers is they are 
they are kind of clawing their way back, okay? So these could make new highs and then turn into what I call a toddler, meaning that they're still relatively new. There's still some relatively new excitement to them. And then we'll treat them just like the core methodology once, they, once they've been trading for a while. So they might be worthwhile trading. And then there's some better than poke in the eyes. Now, truth be told, I'm still in this stock here. Okay, and it is kind of it is kind of clawing its way back higher. Like I said, it seems like on some of these ones that stopped out, they're still kind of hanging in there. And this one really hasn't done anything wrong. You can see it did find its low in fairly early trading, and so forth. So good, I wouldn't rush out and buy it right now. Although if you want to, I won't stop you since I already have a position, right? Okay, but I would definitely wait for it to get to new highs and then pull back. Again, so this, again, might turn into a toddler, but this was better than the poke in the eye as far as the recommendation, the initial profit target, and then the stop, okay? So you got it, and then it you stopped out. So what, okay? Now, the question is, is lighter volume on IP okay? Yes. As a private trader, you could go in and trade an IPO. In my core service, I want to make sure everything's liquid enough to prove that we have a repeatability. So you're going to see more liquid uh, to, within, within reason, uh, IPOs. I mean, I might dip a little bit below the normal volume, okay? But as a private trader, you can go in and trade these, these NERVs and things like that. Um, it's a trade-off. The problem is you can't, you can't dump a whole lot of money in them because, yeah, they are thinner, and you have to be careful. But that's one advantage. That's one advantage we have as private traders is we can – take some risk in these thinner issues, okay, whereas the big boys can't do that. Now, the early early phase demarcation has been pretty cool. And, again, we talked about the fly and we talked about the die. They've been flying, okay. This is um, this is pipe in the ground, okay, or pipe, pipe on a stick. It did drop a little bit in early trading, but it's found it's low pretty quick. And look what it's doing now. Okay, your breakout there would have worked really nicely, and then your TKO there. Okay, so so far so good. So again, they've been flying, they've been dying, and they've been dying. You know, and you've got a lot of them come public, find that high fairly early on, and drop. The beauty of these is that you just don't buy them. It's a Will Rogers trade. If they don't go up. Don't buy them. Now, he was making a yogiism, obviously, but there's a lot of truth to that, at least as far as the IPO market is concerned. All right. Howard's jumping the gun. I didn't, I didn't open up for stocks yet. Okay, I'll open up for stocks. I'm going to start talking about the overall market now. Um, perhaps now it's not a trend, and perhaps it never will be. No, I don't know what you're talking about, Jonathan. Was that part of a, another thing? Is there a feasible way to get on the pre-IPO? No, absolutely not. Get the course. I absolutely not. No, never. Um, you want to get on IPOs? Open up, open up some accounts with uh, with some brokerages that do a lot of underwriting. Put a couple of million dollars in all those accounts. Um, let them know you're interested and take every stinker they give you because if you don't take every stinker they give you, they're not going to give you the good stuff. And guess what? They're going to put a lot of, pardon my French, shit on you. <laughs> you're going to have to eat a lot of crappy IPOs before you get that hot IPO. And the other thing is you never know what's going to happen. So that's why you wait for them to come public, and they fly or they die. If you fly them, you buy them. If they're dying, you avoid them, okay? All right, a couple of announcements real quick. I don't think there's much announcements this week. Uh, I, as you know, I have the store put on the side. I made life a lot easier. As I said a while back, somebody said, Dave, why do you hide your products? You look like somebody who's scared to admit he has products. So from that point forward, I have products. That's how I pay for all this. It costs me several thousand dollars a year to do these webinars, okay? Well, I like doing them, okay? I have fun. I have a blast, but I'm not doing them just for my health, right, or for my own excitement. 
So support me in these efforts, and I'll continue to do these things. Um, volume one, 2014. You like these? If you like these webinars, you're gonna love these deals. Um, like I said, when I was putting together this graphic, uh, I ran out of space and had to make the graphic bigger because I I didn't realize how much stuff we covered. But we covered all of this plus a lot more in the um, in that those recordings. So this is the uh, flash drives, and they're on the website on the store. This is the weekend charts. Um, it's about 30 hours. Okay, and I think everybody else knows all this other stuff. Just go to the store, check it out. All right, let's um, let's get to the charts. Uh, I want to talk about the overall market, the first, and then I want to get into the sectors, and then I want to work my way into the um, individual stocks. Yeah, I mean, you know, I was being kind of. Um, facetious or whatever, talking about the, the how to get IPOs before, but that's what's going to happen. You're going to get a lot of bad IPOs. The more, if, if their job is to unload as much garbage as they can, okay, and if you don't take the garbage, they're not going to give you the good ones, and I, I know I have friends that own uh, or have owned at least brokerages and stuff, and, and um, you know, you, I bet a lot of people in this business, I'm not going to name drop and drop any names or whatever. But he'll tell you flat out, it's like the, you, you got to take a lot, you got to eat a lot of garbage to get the one or two uh, little gems that are out there. You know, he'll tell you flat out. I'm not going to mention who it is, but there's not that many brokerages out there. I'm sure you could figure it out. Um, all right, enough of that. Let's talk about this market here. Let's start with the P's, and I want to work my way out through the subsectors and to the uh, individual issues. Now, here's the deal. The P's pulled back to the prior little base in here, or peak, however you want to look at it, and they found a little support. They won't always bounce off it perfectly like they kind of are now, so don't count on that. But as long as they stay above that peak, I think we'll be okay. Now, keep in mind, as I preach quite often, that if it is a double top in the market, it's not going to be a perfect one. It rarely is, and that's the problem with when you first start learning technical analysis, you think, oh, okay, I got it. I got it. I read, I read the, uh, Edwards and McGee or whatever. Um, what's the other guy's name? Schaubacher. Okay, I think I got it. A double top looks like this. Aha, it's a double top. Well, unfortunately, a double top really looks like this. Okay, or it looks like this. So that's where experience comes in, and you have to realize that a lot of times it's not going to be perfect like that. Is it manipulation? Maybe. Maybe people, maybe they're like, oh, everybody thinks it's going back new highs. We'll sell it here. Uh, let's fake it out above this prior peak, and then we'll take it in. Who cares? Okay, so I wouldn't necessarily say we're in all clear in the P's just because we got past that prior peak because that's sometimes that's how a double top looks okay but so far so good let's not get too bearish too fast like somebody accused me of of, of getting caught up in the day-to-day -day noise no I'm not caught up in the day-to-day -day noise each day brings a new clue okay and if we start dropping below this peak in here, you might want to back off a little bit on the long side, okay? If we start banging out new highs, then obviously you might want to think about adding to the long side. It's that simple, okay? And as I said, ad nauseum, maybe we're getting a bit of a volatility fake out, and hopefully, I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully, next leg is higher, okay? Let's take a look at the quack. Quack at a fairly narrow range. Um, as measured by ATR, as measured by HV, however you want to look at it, okay? But you can see, there's your midpoint here, just kind of bouncing around this little midpoint in here. Not doing anything wrong, okay? It's certainly well above its prior breakout, so you can't, you can't really call that a double top anymore, right? I mean, I'm sure there's some people that would measure it and claim that it's a, it's a, it's a, Ah, the fine moved up to certain position or something. Unless I get too excited about that. 
somebody somebody was arguing with me yesterday about call like like um, predicting the long term said that they predicted a top in 2014 back in 2010 it's like okay well <laughs> good for you so do you sell all your possessions and and you're gonna put them all in the market or how's that gonna work uh, you can only predict the short term again when it comes to markets then somebody was asking me well does that mean you can predict every day no it doesn't mean you predict every day but if you see a market go straight up and you see it pull back then you know that there's a better than average chance that it could revert back to its mean could, could be the tr keyword in that sense okay you don't know for a fact but if I had to err with this market I would err in the direction of I guess they're green now the green arrow okay I need to change it back to blue because that's what I'm always talking about the big blue arrow but anyway so NASDAQ kind of just um, messing around in here long-term uptrend still intact rusty remains a bit of concern and Rusty's been kind of clawing its way higher. Like I've been saying, two steps forward, one step back kind of manner for quite a while. And then it kind of had a bit of a drop in here. So if you back the chart out, it's kind of all over the place in a big, wide, and loose range. Um, I guess in classical technical analysis terms, this would be some sort of complex top, okay? It would probably be something that looks like a uh, a complex head and shoulders or something, and and by complex, I mean multiple tops. That's an actual. That's a so-called uh, complex. Okay, and like a head and shoulders would look like this. Okay, a complex head and shoulders might look like might have. Uh, oh, oh, we wouldn't have like another one in a peak, maybe like two peaks in here, okay? So it's just a big consolidation. At this point, let's call it a big consolidation. We don't know if it's a top or not. If it takes out 105, then, yep, it's probably a top. If it takes out 120, then it's probably not. Anything in between, it's just sideways trading, so let's not read too much into that, okay? Now, in the sectors... It's kind of interesting. The peas, like I said, kind of stalled around their old highs. We do have some brick and mortar type areas that did stall around their prior highs, like the chemicals and energies. Uh, in fact, energies actually sold off fairly hard. If I could find them, there they are. After hitting that little peak in here, okay. So so far, the energy is getting whacked. I would say that I would venture to say that we could start seeing some shorting opportunities really soon in the energies. And that's fine with me because energies can trade contra to the overall market. So we might end up with a situation where the energies sell off and the market goes higher and we get shorts working in energies and also we have longs working in the overall market. What's kind of cool about the energies is you can see that this is the this could turn into the second bow tie in a row at new highs. So you kind of get that double top working for you and the bow tie working for you. So if they don't turn back soon, it could be a lot of trouble. It's been a lot of trouble. Metals and mining have rolled over in here. Uh, gold and silver are sort of leading the way lower, as you can see. Uh, that's silver and that's gold. So even though I'm seeing a couple setups in the gold stocks, I'm avoiding them for now. But let's take a look at gold, the commodity. And there's something interesting going on here. It's dropping, but it's down towards these multi-year lows. Now, with gold, or any market for that matter, sometimes a bottom is more of a process than an event. Okay, So this could be in the process of a major, major bottom. But I'm not predicting it because so far it's two years in the making. Okay. Uh, earlier in 2014, we caught a couple of gold stocks, and we did okay. We caught a little pop out, and then we stopped out the rest, a little pop and stop. Hey, I'm going to write that down, a little pop and stop, okay? Last time we went after them, not so good. We didn't need to follow through. They came right back in. So we're going back to sitting on our hands, and one day we're going to have the mother of all bottoms here. Now, somebody was asking me earlier, do you look at anything under the charts? And it's like, well... No, but I do sometimes think a little bit. I know you find that shocking, but I do think a little bit. And what I'm thinking right now is the whole world's coming unglued. 
you got this ISIS situation. Um, you got uh, Ebola. You got Ebola out there, or whatever it is. And I don't watch a lot of news. I try to avoid it at all costs. But I know there's some stuff going on. I get a little bit through osmosis. So the whole world's going to die from the plague, and we're all going to get killed in war. And what's gold doing? A big shoulder shrug, okay? So that tells me that gold doesn't seem to care at this point in time, and neither should we. So we shouldn't rush out and buy gold at this juncture. Do not bottom fish in gold, okay? Um, if it hits a 30-year low, maybe, okay? But... Uh, anything less than that, don't bottom fish. Wait for some sort of signal for your bottom in gold, okay? So, again, metals and mining have just kind of fallen off in here. And even some of the stronger areas like steel and iron are beginning to get a little choppier in here and have come back in and back to below the prior peaks. Aluminium is pulling back a little bit. If it pulls back much further, then I would avoid it because it looks like it's kind of losing some steam in here. Um, a lot of areas broke out past the prior peak, like the bank, and then banks, and then have come back in. Health services doing okay in here, not too bad. Uh, insurance in general has been doing pretty good, although you don't want to see it pull back below its prior little peak in here. Uh, retail came back with a vengeance; it's pulled back in here. So far, so good. There, transport's kind of hanging in there, although you don't want to see them come back below this prior little peak. So far, so good there. So overall, things are looking pretty good, but there are a few little, I don't want to say chinks in the armor, but for lack of a better word, there are a few little weak areas out there that we're going to keep an eye on, okay? Is there a particular time of day you usually make your trades for Gary? No. If it triggers, and some people say, I don't play amateur hour. Oh, really? Well, guess what? You're going to miss a lot of good trades because uh, I don't remember exactly I'm trying to think of a good example recent example but I don't remember um, I'm trying to think uh, reason reason is before I try to give you an example reason is sometimes sometimes the market opens and then the stock takes off and never looks back okay and and let's say the first 30 40 minutes it makes most of its move and then it just kind of flat lines for the rest of the day well, if you don't trade that open, you're going to miss that move. Okay. Remember, we're 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 position trading for a swing trade, which could last a couple of weeks or so. But we also want to be in this market for a long, long time. So we're not going to obsess over what time of day it is. It's like people put all these rules in there, and all these. It's like they're they, it's, they put so many rules in place that it keeps them from making money. Okay. Now, if you've got some kind of day trading methodology and, and you are, you're scalping a spread and your spreads are too big around the open, then, okay, that's fine, whatever. Okay, knock yourself out. Especially, you know, God bless your point of little head. If you want to stare at every little tick, not to pick one, I shouldn't say that, but for me to stare at a screen all day, ruining your eyes, ruining your back, ruining everything, um, that's not a life, okay? So, yeah, but no, there's no specific time of day. A lot of times trades will trigger on the open. All right, let's let's uh, let's look at some stocks here. AAVL for Mr. Howard. Mr. Howard is a regular visitor to these shows. Uh, nope, it's a little too thin. It is an IPO, so you might want to make that exception. Uh, no, it would have to break out to new highs. And then pull back for me to get excited about that. No, John wants to know about it too. A lot of people want to know about that stock. TSQ. 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 Um, well, it's pretty thin as an IPO, so you'd have to be careful. Um, it's not jumping out of me. I probably want to get off the IPOs. Okay. Um. It, it does have a little bit of a breakout characteristic. I don't want to get into that, though. PEIX, PEIX. Um, that looks like a trend knockout to me. It's got some bad memories way back here and way back here. It can be pretty volatile, but it's not bad. Um, 
I wouldn't say it's a perfect setup because the stock can trade all over the place, but I hear you and I see it. It's a TKM. In fact, you could almost come in here with a, in a textbook manner and trade that. It looks like a possible trade to me, okay? Now, I could pick it apart because it does have some bad memories here and there, okay? But let me interview myself. Does it look like a possible trade? Yes, but if it, it went too much further below where it is today, I would say no. It's not a perfect setup, okay, by any stretch of the imagination. But it sold off so hard that if it makes it all the way back up to this new high, then it could trigger as a trade. So if you're more experienced trader, yeah, I see this as a possible trade. This wouldn't jump out at me as a textbook example of a good trade, okay? You probably won't see this in the service tonight, okay, put it that way. But, yeah, it looks like it possibly could work as a trade. Vips is a short. Well, I wouldn't rush out and start shorting anything just yet. Unless it's possibly an energy company or something. No, I don't see it. Uh, and then you've got it just you've got all this consolidation and fluff under the market right here. If you want to short something, uh, give you a little tidbit here. Okay. If you want to short something, you want to find something. My favorite thing to short, at least, at least given the nature of a market. Our market's been doing this. Okay, that's the stock market in general. Lots of zigs and zags in between, but you get the idea. So if you want to short something, you want to find something that kind of looks like this and might be in the early phases of rolling over. So you want to see it make new highs and then either like the bow tie like that or first thrust, something like that, either one. But you don't want to short something that, looks like this to where it could come down and have a big consolidation. It's almost like you're looking for the bigger they are, the harder they fall. And this is what we could possibly find in the energy stocks. Whew, man, you guys have thrown them out there. Uh, GPRE for film. GPRE. Yeah, that's another one of those TKO. There you go. There you go. That looks pretty good. Now, that's a textbook TKO. That's a good-looking setup, okay? High five, Mr. Phil. Mr. Phil has found the Mac Daddy. Look at that. That's beautiful. That's a tiny Elvis setup. Look at that setup. It's beautiful. Now, one thing I'm not crazy, crazy, crazy about is the fact that it's already ran up about 500,000%, okay? But other than that, as far as a setup, that's a pretty good-looking setup, Okay. Nice little knockout type of move. Nice persistency. So high five on that one. That's the best look. You get the, you're going to get the prize of the day unless we find something else. PBA. Go for a PBR. <laughs> Watching my carbs a little lately. No beer. Which sucks because I own a microbrewery. <laughs> uh, I like a little bit more pullback in that. Uh, it's also an oil and gas uh, company. Energy is a little questionable right now, so I'd, I'd pass. I hear I hear you, though. Nice little pull, nice little breakout, nice acceleration higher, nice little pullback. It's already kind of triggered in that pullback, but that's not bad, okay? Does your methodology work as well for stocks not at or near all-time highs or lows? Well, yeah, I mean, you could have uh, a stock that made all-time all highs 20 years ago. Okay, or all time, you know, all time lows or whatever. Um, if you have a good trend in place, provided that you don't have any overhead supply or any bad memories to deal with, okay, uh, it doesn't have to come off an all time high or low. Those are just some of my favorite setups because if it's coming off an all time low, let's say I call I got Phoenix strategy, okay, which let's say a stock goes down, then basis for a few years and sets up off an all-time low or, or, darn near, or darn near it. Let's say it was $80 a share back here, and now it's uh, $5 a share, okay? Well, possibly all these bad memories have worked its way through the system. So, yeah, that's a great trade off at all-time lows. But, yeah, you could also have a stock that might. That might have made some, you know, tremendous highs way back here, and then it just flatlined and then take it off again, and then... Whatever, it might be somewhere in between here and here, it'd still be a good trade. So it's not always 
on the fringe. I just happen to like a lot of patterns that happen on the fringe. I mean, we just looked at a couple of those PIX. That wasn't really off all time lows or highs, was it? Well, GPRE, uh, yeah, it's all time highs there, but uh, PEIX, okay. Is that off all time lows? No, see, that's not off all time lows. That's kind of in the middle. Well, that GPR looked better. True? I got shaken out of that one. Uh, yeah, it looks pretty good. It's a car and a stick. I like a little bit more pullback, but you can't always get what you want. G Pro. Well, G Pro is going straight up. Camera and a stick. So, yeah, maybe on a pullback, maybe on a knockout. I mean, I don't know. See, that's where I almost have to. I almost want to interject a little bit of reality. A camera on a stick. How long could it go? I don't know. But if it sets up. As a good little trend follower, as a good little trend trader, then maybe, um, then maybe. Oh, to, to finish up on that question, though, if you're shorter term, answer your question, I guess, is yes. Um, white screen. Shorter term. I saw it exaggerated. Let me start over. Shorter term. Okay, shorter term, I'm less excited about trading a market in here because it's within this range here, this big, wide, and loose range. So to answer your question, shorter term, that makes a difference. Longer term... Okay, if we're way out, if we're way out here somewhere or whatever, I don't know. It, it doesn't make as much of a difference. But if you're within that range, shorter term, like in this area here, it does. But once that's way behind you, then it's not as important. Yeah, the key is whether bad memories are in the past. Yeah, that's what Robert, yeah, if your bad memories are, are, are not that far away, then, then there's a problem. SCOK, that's going to be a, a, a bottle rocket. Okay. And people are like, what's a bottle rocket? Well, it goes up like a tremendous amount. Like it went up 100% a couple of days. Now, this stock is on my momentum list, but I didn't personally trade it. But it is on a momentum list, and it was already in the list when it took off. Okay, it's in the Landry list. I'm sorry, Landry 100. I'm just for S and G's. Let's see where we put it in. Here it is. Uh, real time. All right, let's see when and why we put that one in there. Now, I have a lot of fun with this list. I'm not sure I could rush out and trade 100 stocks at a time. It's up 134%. Entry at 283. 15 days ago. All right, what happened 15 days ago? Yeah, it made a new high right here, so that's why it went to the list. If it's sub or probably on this day here in expansion range, if it makes a new high in expansion range, it goes into my momentum list. Is Zen still of interest? Yeah, Zen's on the service, but it's still of interest. Zen is a double top knockout. I'm getting a lot of questions about double top knockouts. This isn't a perfect example, but close enough. Usually you want about three or four days separation in here between these little peaks, you get a sharp little bam, little knockout move, and so far so good, okay? Now, uh, truth be told, I am long this stock, we are long this stock. Um, entry would be, if you wanted to get long again, it'd be about 26. I don't recommend, I don't recommend directly add-on trades for people in my service, meaning that I don't say, okay guys, we're gonna add back half our shares, because it, it just gets too many, too many moving parts. My service, Performance would be a lot better if I did, but I'm trying to make it more than just a tip sheet. I'm trying to make it more like a big, broad stroke and then some specific action to take as opposed to just some little specific action to take, okay? 
But yeah, if you wanted to do an add-on trade, get in around 26. Okay, that'd be a good place to get in on that one. Leju. This is um Israeli company, right? Uh, I don't like the fact it tried to rally, but it came all the way back in. Okay, so that's no good. So now it would have to make new highs for me to get excited about it again. You're welcome, Robert. Are there a maximum number of bars a TKO would take you out or keep you out of a trade? Are there a maximum number of bars that would keep, take you out that would? Okay, I'm not sure what you're asking. Once I'm triggered into a position, I'll stay with it until stopped out, whether that takes a year, a month, a day, or a week. Um, but if your question is, it's just like days of a pullback. After seven or eight days of a pullback, then I begin to question the pullback. But, yeah, if I got a TKO within three or four bars of the high, no big deal. My favorite TKOs often come right off the high. You get that knockout move down, bam, and the market takes right back off. RYI starting to go. Well, is that a closing fund? Find out what it is first. If it's a fund, I'm not interested. Now, T TC sometimes gets these wrong. But if that's a fund, I'm not interested. It hasn't made that big of a move. But I hear you. In your book, you say TKO should take a minimum number of bars. Are, are they the maximum number you would keep from taking a trade? I don't know what what book is that? Where what did I say about a minimum number of bars? Uh, TKO could be a one bar pattern, but it, it, once you're once the market begins pulling back, then you're in a pullback situation. Okay, we're just talking semantics. It doesn't matter. Um, you can get a TKO up three or four bars. Usually, you don't see them that far into a pullback. Okay, AMCF for Andre. Uh, no. Well, there's your bottle rocket. Okay. See, it just went straight up and then came in. It's all over the place. Andre, you brought this one last week. We kind of picked it apart then. Uh, if you're long, stay long, but I don't know why you'd be long on that one. Bought a little pool ball on CMGE, high HV, AMDX, CMGE. No, what? Why would you buy that? It's all over the place. See, that's one of these mid-range stocks that I would just avoid. It's just it's just between this big. It's all over the place, and it's kind of between mid-ranges. Um, it just I'd leave it alone. It's just too much. It's too much jockeying for position in something like that. Too many bad memories. Too recently. I N U V. U V. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good looking stock. It looks like it's gotten past its um, most of its bad memories in here. Pulling back a little bit. A little bit thin, though. Super thin for the price of the stock. I mean, if you go in and trade, I don't know, how would you trade on this? Let's say you trade 2,000 shares or something, and it's, it's or 10,000 shares even. Um, it's only 300,000 shares on average, and then only 80,000 today. Especially given the price. Too thin. I, I hear you. It looks like it's bottomed out. A little wide and loose longer term. But, yeah, it's bottomed out. looks like it's pulling back and has potential. Okay, let's go to SIMO, S-I-M-O, SIMO. SIMO. Okay. Um, well, it broke out, then it pulled back to its prior breakout. So... That would be a red flag. Um, it's also had a pretty good run, like a 300% run. I think I would pass. For me, I have to get really excited about something when it's had that 300% run and has also pulled back into its prior little base in here. I hear you, though. It's not bad, but picking it apart, I see a couple of issues. CEP for James. A uh, little on the thin side. It's also kind of extreme in its move. It's already shot up a couple hundred percent in here, or at least 100 percent. 
And then you got this huge wide range bar here. Uh, now it's just chop it around. I'd leave it alone. Don's here. Anyone want to guess what you might want to know about? Well, Forge, break it down. That's an ugly looking chart. It's also electrocardiogram, but you can see it's beginning to break down. It might provide some shorting opportunities, but it's so thick, and you got so much trading in here and all. I would, I would leave it alone. I think there's going to be better shorts out there. But yeah, longer short, short, PCRX. I know you always have an eternal position there, Don, and you're talking your position. This one's not bad. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's got eight, about eight days of the pullback, so it would have to do something soon for me to get excited about it. But it's not bad. It's a little on the thin side, but it's a hundred dollar stock, so dollar wise, dollar times volume wise, it's a lot bigger than like that last stock we looked at. Rada. No, where have you been? No, <laughs> you might have to whip out Nicholas. That doesn't sound right, does it? N I C H. Where's Nicholas? Here it is. No, who who asked that? You know, I'm just, I'm gonna start kicking people out again. That's it. Look, it went up like four hundred percent. Okay. That's just too crazy. 242. 242% on the 50 day HV. <laughs> That's ridiculous. I wonder what a six day is. Probably like a million. No, it's just too crazy. It's dangerous. It's just speculation at best and something like that. Okay. Okay, we're going to have to start wrapping it up soon. Xnet for Gene. Xnet. Let me see if we can get to some people I hadn't gotten to recently. Um. One thing I don't like about IPOs is I don't like buying them after they had the die phase somewhere in between. I actually like to, it, it, it. Sometimes it, that has kind of hurt performance, or I had missed some winners, I should say. It hasn't hurt performance. Uh, I prefer to let them get the new highs. Once If they die out really bad like this, I prefer them to get the new highs before uh, going after them. Like Ears is a good example of that. We had a buy on Ears, and it dropped like a stone. So it, it wasn't of interest until it went back up and triggered, okay, and made new highs, okay? MTLS, IPO, flu, okay, A run. All right, A R U N. Uh, no, it's going straight up, but it would have to have a pullback. It's also kind of wide and loose in here. MTLS, what are your thoughts on MTLS? An IPO that initially flew and then returned to what might be considered a good entry point and now testing a breakdown. Um, no, I don't see a good entry point because it came all the way back in, okay? So it took off, and it really did. I don't know if you could have gotten your profit target or not in there, but then it came all the way back in, and then you leave it alone. I think, was that one of the losers I just show, showed? I think it. it's like I get it's so many stocks to keep up, but I forget. But, yeah, I think that's one of the losers because it, it came all the way back in. So for me to get excited about it again, I would have to make new highs. Well, we're like way long for this session, so if it gets too long and the recordings are hard to manage, so let me um, go ahead and wrap things up. Uh, I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody, but uh, bring your picks next week. We'll, we'll get to them. Uh, anything I may answer, you can shoot me an email also. Um, I love doing these shows. I have a blast doing them, as you can tell, and I appreciate uh, you guys taking time on your busy schedule to be here. I'm humbled by your appearance, so I appreciate that. Uh, and uh, I guess we'll see you guys again next week. Thank you so much. Again, shoot me an email if you got any questions. Um, if we don't talk between now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. And um, I guess see you next week, if not sooner. Thank you so much.